Let me ask uh, Amitabh Kundu to uh, be the next speaker. Um, Professor Amitabh Kundu is at the uh, Jawaharlal Nehru University in Delhi. He's uh, among our most leading scholars on urban issues, uh, which you will see for yourself. Uh, he's also now a member of the National Statistical Commission. Amitabh? Dr. Awad Davis, Dr. Rakesh Mohan, colleagues and friends. It's an honor and privilege for me to associate with this Urban Age Conference, uh, specifically sharing the session with Dr. Ricky Burdett and Professor Saskia Sassen. Let me straight away take you from the dualistic urban morphology of Sao Paulo and Shanghai and Manhattan to the Indian city system. The dualism of Indian economic and social structure is manifest nowhere as distinctly and as emphatically as in the trends, patterns, and projections of urbanization. On the one hand, there are apprehensions that there will be urban explosion, exodus from the rural areas to the urban areas in the next four to five decades for good or bad reasons associated with globalization, crossing the magic limit of 50% of urban population by 2050 or even earlier. On the other hand, there are serious concerns that large number of small and medium towns are not experiencing the economic and the demographic growth, particularly in the backward regions. Now, as far as the projection exercises are concerned, I must say that most of them have been carried out within the framework of an alarmistic framework of over-urbanization. And this is one thesis of over-urbanization on which there seems to be a convergence of views between the proponents of globalization and the critics of globalization. They all tend to talk about a massive urban growth, although the data from the population census just indicate a significant deceleration from 3.8% uh, annual exponential growth rate in the 70s to 3.1% per annum in the 80s to currently 2.7% in the 90s. Now, it's indeed true that UN projections, particularly UN population division, are closer to reality and every second year they have revised the projected urban population downwards the moment they had access to the sampling registration system or the census data, but still, it's on the higher side. Basically, because of the methodology of projection, urban-rural growth differential for India is taken to be increasing to some hypothetical urban-rural growth differential, which is set too high, and I think most of the projections for the larger cities for, by the UN population division is on the higher side. I don't think I have time here to speculate on the factors which are responsible for this alarmistic viewpoint on urbanization. Is it the vested interest of the elite class who want larger location for the uh, better off and so-called middle class localities? Is it the justification of the massive demolitions and evictions that have taken place in many of the metropolitan cities? Or is it because of a rationale, building a rationale for the negative perspective on migration that Dr. Rakesh Mohan quoted from UNFP, a document which has also pointed this out. But nonetheless, all the calculations that we did at our center by taking alternate scenarios does tell, and I'm answering this question whether the urban growth rate is likely to go up. Indeed, urban growth rate population growth rate, would, urban population would certainly decline. That's basically because of population growth rate going down. But urban-rural growth differential is likely to go up a bit, and our projection tells that the projected urban population by 2050 would be somewhere between 40 or 42 percent, basically because of the exclusionary urban growth that we have, which is denying a large number of poor in the rural areas to put a foothold in the urban centers, and also denying small and medium towns and backward regions to experience rapid economic and demographic growth. Now, I think uh, the second important point that I would like to mention is that there is likely to be a paradigm shift in the 
pattern of urbanization since independence i would say 50s onwards we have noted that the relatively less developed states in india have recorded slightly higher urban growth rate but this has changed in the 90s we do find that developed states are recording higher demographic growth and as far as size class wise growth rates are concerned i remember dr rakesh mohan was the first in the early 80s who tried to systematize the calculations but we agreed that class 1 cities which is 100000 plus population are experiencing slightly higher growth rate compared to small and medium towns and i would like to mention that this disparity in the growth rates have widened in the 90s is likely to go up in future years and disparity across districts across regions and across size class of urban centers has become much higher inequality has become much higher which is likely to go up and if you ask me what is the single major concern as far as the larger cities of india are concerned i would say that it is the significant deceleration in the growth rate of small and medium towns and even the number of census towns going down which has happened in the 91 2000 census everything related to demography of india has re recorded an increase but the number of census towns going down certainly is one of the major concerns i think for the one future and again which is very very surprising illiterate women their employment opportunities have gone up significantly in the urban areas basically 55% of them are absorbed as domestic help and they are reported by the way by official statistical agencies as regular workers we did a quick calculation at the national statistical commission we are really surprised that regular wages for the you know the wages real wages for regular workers have declined in the past 5 years when india has recorded about 9% growth rate in real terms i would like to talk about a process of peripheralization i think there is a process of selective degenerated peripheralization around many of the metropolitan cities alain bertrand talked about you know he shared his concern that many of the indian cities the land value gradients don't follow the smooth you know distance decay function from the core to the periphery in a way such concerns are likely to be become less and less important in future years because the micro level studies for eight cities that we have compiled for an urban poverty report does show that there has been a process of quote unquote sanitization of the large cities the slums and the informal activities low valued informal activities located in the heart of the city and basically the land value gradients were not following smooth gradients because of the state intervention because of imperfection of legislation and administrative interventions now this to some extent has been remedied and also a study for ncaer village level data shows something very interesting which is published in economic and political weekly i did the analysis before 5 or 6 years which shows that around the large cities there is a degenerated periphery within the distance of let's say 10 to 15 kilometers from the boundary of the city which has high infant mortality rate high maternal mortality rate low literacy low per capita income low per capita consumption expenditure and low level of literacy uh, also i would like to mention another study which is uh, done with dfid support uh, jeff pain in london he was really organizing this 11 country study and i did the chapter for uh, delhi and ahmedabad indian city and what we noted is very very interesting uh, that uh, yeah the, we noted that partial you know activation of the land market through reform in the land tenure system and strengthening of the legislation really results in breaking down of the informal agreements which the slum dwellers have entered into with the you know with the local slum leaders or counts municipal councillors or the officials and they get pushed out and there is a process of uh, you know selective 
degenerated peripheralization, which has some negative significance, which has to be taken care of when you're talking about shining India. And indeed, the macro scenario in many of the large cities does give us this kind of a confidence of shining India. But the problem, the two problems I'd like to conclude by referring to them is that, you know, uh, linking of the cities with the global economy has certainly on an average improved the strength of the uh, economy of the metropolitan cities and class one cities and also has improved the quality of infrastructure and basic services. But the inequality has gone up and the inequality within the city is basically linked with water supply and sanitation services. I think it is quite likely given the perspective that the local bodies would provide differential level of services to different wards depending on the effort, affordability of the locality and the connection with the media. Resident welfare associations have become very, very powerful in most of the metropolitan cities who are getting also support from civil society organizations have been in a position to make an impact on efficiency. That is absolutely no doubt. But at the same time, this politically powerful group of resident welfare associations have been able to take a disproportionate share of the total basic amenities and administrative attention. And that is also resulting in inequality and subcontracting of services to some of the private agencies would link it up, link up the quality of the service with the affordability of the localities, which would also increase inequality. And by the way, 74th Constitutional Amendment also talks about the, you know, giving powers of organizing the basic amenities and the quality and the prices to be determined at the ward level. And if that happens, I would think that it will be institutionalization of inequality in many of the cities. I would just talk about two major problems that we have to really take care of when we are moving towards fast globalization and linking our cities to the global economy, which is absolutely essential for overall economic growth. One is this threat of health, hygiene, and also epidemics. Uh, I think uh, the average health situation in a city does not depend on average expenditure on health. It depends on the expenditure that you make on water supply and sanitation facilities, and that too, not in the you know, average expenditure, but the marginal expenditure that you make in the marginal colonies. And I would think that the inequality in the urban system would really increase the threat of this health and hygiene and epidemics in many of the large cities in future years, and the rich localities would be looking for private and personalized solutions to the, uh, the, the you know, problems of public health. The final point is about, uh, is about the, uh, the law and order situation uh, in the larger cities which would get linked up, and we have already heard about some of this problem in the earlier presentation. I was looking at, I reviewed a book by Gappard, American Cities in 21st Century, out of 14 papers, I think nine papers talked about law and order problem. Similar things are coming up, and I, would th I think within the next one and a half decade, this might become really a major issue unless we do something about this problem. And uh, I looked at uh, the data of the 84 riot situation in Delhi. And you can clearly map the areas of violence, individual and group violence, and map the areas of deficiencies. These two are going strongly together. Three of my doctoral students have really, at the ward level data for five or six cities linked up level of basic amenities and level of you know, individual and group violence very strongly uh, giving correlations, which certainly is an area of, area of concern. I would think that for having sustainable development, we'll have to do something about this exclusionary urban growth process. We must have uh, promote number of small and medium towns. I think this is the perspective that the German Chancellor yesterday also talked about, uh, you know, allowing large number of small and medium towns to absorb the migrants from the rural areas so that, uh, so that you know, they do not move towards the larger cities. And also we'll have to stall the process of degenerated peripheralization and segmentation of the cities by basically taking the 
overall responsibility of providing the minimum level of services to all sections of the population by the public agencies, while involving the private agencies and the community for efficiency and accountability will be must, but the responsibility of ensuring the minimum level of amenities would have to be taken by public agencies. I think without this kind of an agenda, the objective of sustainable de urban development would be a pipe dream. Thank you. The third question that strikes me as extremely important, which has already been raised here, how these cities are absorbing the migrant population. And I think I would agree with Rakesh that uh, remarkably good job is done in India also. I looked at the 61st round national sample survey data, which calculates poverty percentage for the class one cities, which has gone down significantly. Percentage of people for uh, in the class one cities is somewhere between 10 to 12 percent for Mumbai. I would like to mention to Professor Sassen that it would not be more than 7 to 8 percent if you take the unit level data from the National Sample Survey for 2004-2005. But this poverty level is half of what we have noted in small and medium towns. If you look at the disparity in terms of access to other basic amenities, drinking water, sanitation and electricity, you find the gaps between small and large cities is two and a half times to three times. And the point that I consider to be extremely important is that with globalization, there are very many positive manifestations that we see that uh, larger cities are in a position to tap the global market. Nationally also, they have been able to mobilize resources by floating bonds or other financial instruments, by taking the help of credit rating agencies. Many of these cities have not been able to really reform their property tax system, but they have been larger cities taking advantage of the more liberal environment with globalization coming up, 74th constitutional amendment for empowerment of the local bodies, have been able to increase their other sources of revenue. But nonetheless, the gap between large and small towns have certainly gone up. Even if you look at the expenditure in the public, uh, by public agencies, state and the central government, you do find that the disparities are high and larger cities are in a position to get higher per capita allocation. I'm not only talking about Jawaharlal Nehru National Urban Renewal Mission, which is focusing on 63 basically large cities. But there's a parallel program for the small and medium towns, and I did a calculation to really see that uh, the per capita allocation under the parallel program for the small and medium towns, once again, is about one-tenth of what we have noted. You know, more importantly, much of the investment which has come up is for, linked with the economic infrastructure, is also linked with the basically real estate development and the global capital market, and not much is going to the social sectors, which is creating some sort of crisis in the social dimensions in the urban system. I would like to mention that infant mortality rate in India was going down significantly in the 80s, but the rate of decline has gone down. The rate of decline has declined in the 90s. Maternal mortality rate is another area of concern where there is virtually no decline. I would like to just mention that India is certainly going to reach the MDG target of reducing poverty to half the level by 2015. By all our calculations, everybody in the Planning Commission is convinced and everywhere else that poverty certainly would go down. But as far as the social, other social agenda is concerned, MDG in terms of access to sustainable drinking water, Ex, you know, uh, slum population improvement in their conditions, bringing down infant mortality rate, maternal mortality rate, access to education, equality, gender equality. I think our major failures would be certainly manifest in, the, in these social sectors and urban uh, segment also would report very alarming failures in terms of these social uh, dimensions. I would like to touch upon the urban economy which is not a very important component in the context of this seminar, but I must say that is a low-cost support system which we have been able to create in many of the large cities. And 
I think Professor Saskia talked about new kind of informal economy. I have described them as formally informal workers who are working in the organized sector but don't have a share in the benefits. They are working you know, shoulder to shoulder within the organized sector but don't have the social protection. There are these informal sector workers producing cheap commodities and services which are being used by the formal sector to be reflected in the global competitiveness and their efficiency. And also the households that are engaged with the globalizing sectors are getting a cheap support system in terms of domestic assistance. Again, the analysis of the latest data for 2004-05 does show that there is a significant growth of male in migration who are semi-skilled, primary education, secondary level of education, which means that agricultural laborers being thrown out of rural economy, coming and finding job in the urban areas have become extremely difficult. But some amount of market-friendly skills, skills, street, street smartness would be required in order to be absorbed in this you know, formally informal sector.